morning to you. Ugh. Really? Yeah, couldn't resist. In honor of St. Patrick's Day, we've got a shamrock shake, and each purchase raises money to help the Leprechaun Restoration Foundation. The what now? Well, leprechauns are endangered. There was this whole centuries-long stint where humans kept trying to capture and or kill them for the supposed gold at the end of the rainbow, that's a myth, by the way, and to chop them up into little tiny bits that they turned into good luck charms. Yeah, yeah, I was going to do leprechaun cookies, but in light of that, no. So instead, it's four-leaf clover sugar cookies and brigadeiros with green sprinkles. The shamrock shakes are also given just a little spell of good luck by the boss. Not much, but just enough that I would recommend asking that cute girl out with one of those in your gut. I said you should totally ask out that cute girl. I'll take two cookies and one of those shamrock shakes, uh, small, please. My kid's got a baseball game. Something tells me that they'll do very well. Something tells me you need to grow a spine. What was that? Nothing. 1051. Thank you. Toss the change in the tip jar. And will you also be getting a shamrock shake? No. Come on! I don't like St. Patrick's Day. What, don't like green? Green is fine, but something about all of the beer and pressure to get drunk just itches the skin of a recovering drug addict, you know? You know, I bet you could learn to like the day if you created some good memories. I will give you a dozen cookies if you do not bring it up for the rest of the day. <sighs> Fine. Happy day after St. Patty's Day, or as I like to call it, hangover day. Hi, yeah, uh, could I get your blackest coffee and your biggest cup? Are you sure you don't want the hangover special? It is specifically designed and enchanted to instantly cure all symptoms of hangovers. Oh, bless you. How much for a large? Eight dollars. Okay, I know inflation is bad, but it cannot be that bad. It is the day after a holiday that is specifically designed for drunkenness, and I have the only one-size-fits-all catch-all immediate cure. We call that extortion. <sighs> I hate you. See... That's one of the reasons that I went sober. The hangovers just are not worth it. On a related note, my sobriety birthday is next week. You guys want to come? What's a sobriety birthday? It's the anniversary of when I went sober, a.k.a. a sobriety milestone. It's five years next week. Well, congratulations. Eh, it should be seven, but I had a little relapse when I was forced to drop out of college. Five years is still impressive, and we all have little slip-ups. The important thing is you got back on track. Now, I'm embarrassed to say that I've never done a sobriety birthday before and I do not know the proper protocol. Is it customary to give gifts or wear a suit or... Oh no, 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 none of that fancy stuff. I'm doing a potluck style, so just bring something to eat or drink. Store-bought is totally fine. No one's gonna shame anybody for that. It's just gonna be a few friends, my sponsor, and some of my non-dickish relatives. Cool, I'll bring the wine. The non-alcoholic stuff, obviously. Pretty sure that's just called fruit juice. Yeah, but we're gonna go with that fancy stuff, like the fizzy drinks and those elegant glass bottles that actually taste really good. So who else are you inviting? Uh, well... Oh, hey, Nicole. You're here late. I got a little drunk last night and was sleeping off a hangover from St. Patrick's. What are you all talking about? Um... <clears throat> oh, well, my sobriety birthday is next week. It's just a, a little celebration of me staying clean. Not a big deal. Uh, did you want to come? It's really casual, like potluck style. Just some friends and I are going to hang out. Nothing really fancy. Well, Cyrus is going to bring the fancy fruit juice, but, like, I totally get it. If you don't want to come, I'll come. Yeah. 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 Great. Awesome. Cool. Uh, I will see you there. You know, the storage closet is big enough to squeeze both of them in there. Someone's bound to make a move. Patience, my protege. I have the non-boozy booze. Thanks for picking us up, Nicole. You're welcome. I was surprised you don't have a car. We do, but it's in the shop. Excuse me, Cyrus, budge over. Sorry for the inconvenience, Nicole. It's all right. I thought JC said to be casual. Yeah, no, this is casual for her. I can't wear anything too pretty at work for fear of spilling something on it. Don't take away my chance to be shiny. 
What did you bring? Store-bought meat and cheese platter. I figure someone should be mildly responsible and healthy. Lame. What are you bringing? It's in the trunk. That, that's a pretty big cake. My college friend married a baker, so I get a discount. I asked JC for their favorite flavor, so it's strawberry with chocolate frosting. Do you think they'll like it? I will be stunned if they don't. Hey guys, welcome to me Diminuto with Departmento. Whoa, that's a big cake. <gasps> Chocolate and strawberry. Yeah. Sorry if I overdid it. What the hell are you apologizing for? The leftovers of that are going to live in my fridge for a week. We shall feast like kings. Let me help you put it on the table. Hey JC, we're going to plug in your Xbox and play Mario Kart. Mario Kart? Oh, you play? Since it was invented. Give me that controller. G -g -g Remember that you're a guest and to be polite. I will politely make them eat my pixelated dust. Hi, JC calls me Cyrus. He, him pronouns. Ryan, he, him. Gay as fuck. We went to college together. Ryan does mine melting accounting. Yeah, Nicole, there's space uh, right next to the ribs. My sponsor Jenny made them. Oh, better than anything you're going to get at a steakhouse. Isn't it rude of them to play a game at your party? Are you kidding? That's the primary reason half these people showed up. The other half are playing Cards Against Humanity. I like my parties just super casual and chill, you know? Like, if you want to play a game, great. If you just want to hang out and talk, also great. If you want to just sit in the corner with a book, hey, I'm not going to stop you. I want to celebrate the milestone, but, like, I don't like it when everything is about me. Or when anything is about me, really. Being the center of attention is awkward, especially when you don't know if you did something good or bad. Or even if you do know, bad experiences make the whole thing unpleasant. I'm bad at Cards Against Humanity and at talking to people, but I can do Mario Kart. You're talking just fine with me. We'll uh, let the boys play the first round or two if they want, and then we'll tell them to budge over. I never pegged you for a gamer. It was my main comfort before I got into art. There's another game I really like called Diablo 2. Ew, accounting? Hmm, I like the work. And my workplace is run mostly by gnomes and goblins, so we're constantly playing pranks on each other. It's great. Goblin and no Hold on. Are you talking about the jewelry place on 3rd Street that sent what looked like rhinestone flower arrangements to a bunch of local businesses, only to have them blow up in a shower of glitter that I still, to this day, cannot completely get clean from the counter? Maybe. Cyrus? Yeah, boss? Destroy him. Hey, hey, hey. No murder in my apartment. I gotta clean up after you leave. Jennifer Charles, please. Of course Cyrus and I would clean up whatever mess we make, no matter how bloody. Don't drag me into this. I'm just following orders here. I don't think that's going to fly in a court of law, buddy. Rats. Well, we'll just have to hope that Death by Luigi placates the boss. Nicole, you want a controller? Hey, Nicole. Thanks again for coming to my sobriety birthday yesterday. I know you're more of an introvert. Yeah, but it was mostly video games, so it was fun. I wish I could have beaten Cyrus. Hey, you came terrifyingly close. Like I said, I've been playing since it was invented. Same with Halo and Pac-Man. Want your usual? Yes, please. Is Bob in? We were talking about books and I promised to loan her something. Right here. Oh, and you brought me a pretty. Excellent. I will be sure to return this. Ugh. Really? I'm sorry, ma'am. Were you waiting to place an order? No, no, no. That's not the issue. You're reading that? Oh, yes. What about it? Well, it's clearly trash. Have you ever heard the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover? Admittedly, it's usually not used quite so literally. That book is obviously what? Fantasy? Science fiction. Ah, worse. At least fantasy doesn't pretend to be a legitimate reading. You're one of those genre snobs, aren't you? Call me what you will, but only classic literature and nonfiction count as actual books. Everything else is just dumb. It doesn't require the mental fortitude to truly understand the themes and intricacies of the novel. Well, okay, look, I'm not a big reader by any stretch of the imagination, but even I know that's BS. You're just jealous because you're not smart enough to understand true literature. And that's not your fault. Modern media is flooded with trashy stories, especially the romance genre. That's just, it just lowers your IQ with every chapter. They don't have any deeper meaning other than these two people bone, or this person fights a bunch of bad guys. And that's not even touching on movies, television, social media. Right because TikTok is nothing but bad dance moves. Exactly. 
I can't do this one justice. Cyrus? So what I'm hearing here is two arguments. The first is that only dumb people read lighthearted books with no deeper meaning and that the only genre of books with deeper meanings that touch on the human condition are classic literature and nonfiction books. Is that correct? We'll leave the TV and movie argument alone for now. That's for another time. Yes. All right, to your point A, a person's reading level or story preference is not an indication of their intelligence, like at all. While there are plenty of books and stories out there that don't have any deeper meaning or are super obvious or cheesy, that doesn't necessarily make them bad. That just makes them popcorn or cotton candy. Sometimes you want the literary equivalent of a Thanksgiving meal that takes hours, if not days, to digest. Your Iliad and Odyssey, Crime and Punishment, Count of Monte Cristo, Little Women, that type of thing. And sometimes you want popcorn, something simple and easy to digest, like Mary Janice Davidson's earlier undead books, Undead and Unwed, Undead and Unemployed. Those are just designed to make you laugh and get you horny. And that's totally fine. Sometimes you just want to turn the brain off for a little while. That doesn't make the stories particularly bad or their fan base or creators idiots. But too much of it means nothing. Boss tutored me with a college level grind. I was slammed with history, mathematics, science, and weaponry for decades. You think that I'm going to have any space in my brain to properly appreciate Jane Austen's top tier wit or Tolkien's in-depth world building? Tolkien wrote fantasy garbage. Which leads us to point B. Fantasy, sci-fi, horror, and romance have always held deeper meaning and literary themes since they were a thing. I mentioned Jane Austen. She invented modern romance with a cautionary tale about not judging a book by its cover. Frankenstein, the grandmama of sci-fi, was a look at the worrying rate of scientific progress, people's ultra-casual attitude toward it, and how thoroughly destructive a narcissistic, self-absorbed attitude like Victor Frankenstein's is to his life. And it still influences the way people see real-world issues like artificial intelligence. Tokens, Hobbit, and Lord of the Rings series is a tapestry of the horrors of war, the evil of greed and ambition, and how people need to value smaller everyday things if they want to live a happy, fulfilling life. It values humility. On a related vein, Terry fucking Pratchett, just everything he wrote. He tackles every social justice issue you can think of. Another good author. Much later. Speaking of racism, Dr. Nadia Korfor tackles that, colonialism, imperialism, sexism, and a dozen other contemporary issues in her Afrofuturism stories. R.F. Kuang is very similar, but from a Chinese perspective rather than Nigerian. And she goes for more all-out fantasy rather than sci-fi or folklore. Now, see Emma Longi. She specializes mostly in sexism and general oppressive systems overall. None of these ladies are subtle about it, but it's there. Also, okay, I, I get it. Speculative fiction has some good reads, just handled differently. I still don't like it. You don't have to. Nobody's obligated to like a work of art, even if it's objectively well-crafted. I can't read or watch any horror, especially Stephen King, because I get too scared and I don't get any sleep, like, at all. But that doesn't give you the right to shit all over it and declare that anyone who likes this stuff is an idiot, because then you're just being an asshole. Easy. Oh, core, uh, for. I've read Kwong. You mentioned a Justine Irish? Justina Ireland. She's done some stuff for Marvel, but you want her Dread Nation duology. I'm honestly, I'm just amazed that you're such a nerd. I've never seen you bring a book to work the way Bob does. Well, I'm dyslexic and it's a bad idea to listen to audiobooks at work. Aha! So you're not even a real reader. Oh, you're gonna argue this now? Okay. Audiobooks don't count as real reading. Of course they do. It's the exact same content, just absorbed in a different way. Uh-uh, no. You need to see and touch the words. That's the only true way to read. Bullshit. You do realize that visual reading is very new, right? For the vast majority of human history, you absorb stories by listening to them. Best example, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Books have been around for centuries. Yeah, but only a handful of people could actually read them, and even fewer of them had the time. So one of the most common and efficient ways to share stories was to have one person read the book out loud to a room full of people while they worked on various chores churning butter, making clothes, whatever. That's how fairy tales were invented. The only difference between them and now is the recording equipment. Times have changed. You need to physically read the book for it to count. So I guess dyslexic or vision impaired people are just shit out of luck, huh? Or poor people who don't have the time between their two or three jobs to sit down and read. You make time. Oh, bless your heart. What was that old timer? Oh, insulting my ward and my guest. That's a choice. 
I believe the modern term of what you're doing is gatekeeping. You sit on your little high horse and declare what does and doesn't count as reading just so you can feel superior. Problem is, Shakespeare is Shakespeare, whether you're reading the script, listening to the script, or watching the play. Romeo, Desdemona, and Hamlet all still die at the end. Hi. Spoilers! If you're really passionate about books, you'll make time to sit and read them. And if you're dyslexic or whatever, then you just have to try harder. Or they could just read audiobooks, which are designed to be more accessible. Cyrus, you mentioned someone called Polk. Polk. P-O-L-K. I've read their Witchmark trilogy, but apparently Midnight Bargain is better and a bit more relevant. You didn't read anything. And neither will you, by your argument. Enjoy three years of severe dyslexia. Uh, stock up on Tylenol and Advil now. You will get headaches if you want to try and sit and visually read. Oh, I'll show you. Thanks, boss. And you, ma'am, for the backup. Oh, of course, darling. I know you can handle yourself, but they were just going on and on. I've only recently started getting to the audio and the podcast. These eyes aren't what they used to be, and it's much more enjoyable if I can sit back and listen rather than squint at some old pages. Plus, I get more work done. Oh, what do you read? Oh, what is the modern term for it? Oh, right. Smut.